Okay, so in this last part of class, uh, as I said at the beginning, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, and I'm going to get a chance to learn a little bit about you uh, with that first writing assignment I'll tell you about uh, at the very end of the lecture. Uh, so we'll talk about me for a little bit, uh, and where I'm coming from, then I'm going to give you that little bit of refresher of some things that you probably encountered in your other writing classes, and maybe some new ideas that you haven't encountered, uh, which can be useful too. And then I'll tell you about that um, weekly writing assignment that will be due um, by next week. Okay. So here's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, this picture here you can see uh, my folks' house. My dad uh, has been building that house for over 35 years. I have spent a lot of my childhood helping him build that house. Um, but it's uh, two stories, has a basement. My folks are living in the basement right now while they complete the interior of the upper floors. It hasn't been finished yet because uh, my dad's been doing everything by himself, by hand, you know, handcrafting everything. Um, but uh, you know, that, that's that been an informative part of my my experience growing up is like learning how to do things. Um, like, you know, my dad, you know, he's from the auto parts business, you know, was a drag racer back in the day. My mom used to uh, race dirt bikes before I was born. Um, and so they didn't have a background necessarily of like carpentry, masonry work, etc. So my dad would have to learn those things. Once he learned them, he'd put them into practice into building the house. Um, so I think there's a, a value in that of learning new things. Uh, and that's something that I can say that uh, I take from my dad. Uh, I've worked a lot of different places. Um, you know, growing up, I worked at our family auto parts store. Um, then when I went to college uh, at Georgia Tech originally, uh, things didn't work out for me, so I went and worked in the private sector for a while. Um, I worked at Gamekeeper, which was owned by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, then I got into IT work, um, working at Netlink uh, Communications uh, on St. Simons Island. Uh, then I got jobs at MindSpring, and MindSpring got um, were merged with Earthlink, uh, for better or worse. Uh, but I mean, these are places where I um, began not only learning about you know, technology and you know, what we can use it for in terms of communication, but also working in very collaborative environments um, and seeing how collaboration is is vital to. Um, a successful workplace. Uh, but even though things didn't work out for me originally at Georgia Tech, uh, I did find my way back there to get my Bachelor of Science degree in Science, Technology, and Culture. Um, and so I graduated from there uh, in 2006. But I will say to everybody, like, you know, it's, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get where you're wanting to go, that the path, of, you know, uh, of your journey can provide you with innumerable experiences. So, you know, I started at Georgia Tech originally as a physics major, um, went into work at, in IT, and then found my way back into a major that, you know, taught me design skills uh, using um, um, different tools for building websites, uh, building animation, etc., but then also getting a theoretical background that I could use toward pursuing a degree in English later on. So after uh, Georgia Tech, I got my master's in science fiction studies at the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Uh, that was one of my most favorite uh, experiences in my lifetime, being able to live in England for a year. Um, and it's also the place that at the time had the only dedicated master's of science fiction studies program in the world. Uh, and they had an extensive collection of books and magazines, journals and fanzines in their library that I was able to make use of uh, in, in my research. Uh, so a really great place um, that gave me the springboard to then go into a PhD in English program back in the United States at Kent State University, which you may have heard of from your history books uh, from the Vietnam War era where um, ROTC uh, students uh, were given live ammunition and they killed and maimed a number of students that were protesting the Vietnam War. So there's that dark history uh, I can't state that they've tried to 
you know, make amends for in the way that the programs are work uh, and the types of you know, studies that take place there now. And also that memory of that uh, doesn't go away. There's something very respectfully held on to there. Uh, but I got my Ph.D. in English there. And then I went back to Georgia Tech, where I actually taught there for two years as a Britain fellow. Uh, it's their writing program. Uh, they give uh, folks uh, up to three years of time to be in the fellowship. Uh, but while I was there on my second year, I was applying for jobs and you know things worked out that I got to come to City Tech. Um, and so I left the, the Georgia Tech writing program early and started my job working with you all here at City Tech. Um, I will say that this has been like you know, an eye-opening experience for me um, that you know, even though I'm uh, you know, there, there are some things I think that I have in common with many of my students at City Tech, many of you possibly included. Uh, you know, I come from uh, a first generation um, uh, college experience background. You know, my folks, they never went to college. My dad didn't even graduate high school. Um, so there were, you know, they saw value in education, but they weren't equipped to help me with that. Um, but, you know, through books and through other mentors, I was able to get to a place where uh, I was able to attain degrees and then eventually be able to work at a school where uh, I feel closely aligned with its mission, both in terms of lifting people up, um, of being able to, you know, show how technology can be a powerful force for um giving people opportunities, both in terms of careers, but then also of equipping them to uh, lift others around them, um, which isn't necessarily this, you know, a lot the same thing that you, know, you might think of at some of the other schools where I've both gone to school or that I've taught before. Uh, so City Tech to me is a very special place and I'm glad to be here, but I'll be honest with you that I had never been to New York City before I flew up here for 24 hours for my job interview. Uh, and even then, obviously, I had no idea what New York City was like. So this has been a, a, a very humbling learning experience for me, uh, the years that I've been here, uh, that I've been fortunate enough to be a city tech. Now, in some of the work that I, I do here, uh, unfortunately, you guys can't go by my office in NAM 520 um, because of you know, campus closing and everything. Uh, but I do keep uh, an extensive collection of retro computers, of vintage computers in the office that I use. Uh, I would have used these computers in our 2575 class um, had we had the opportunity uh, for some assignments. But unfortunately, we don't. Uh, I may think of other ways that we might you know, investigate some of that stuff, but it isn't you know, absolutely necessary. Um, but I do think there's a value in studying these old computer artifacts because even though... Uh, you know, some companies would like you to believe that, you know, they're developing the next greatest thing, uh, that, de that progress is always onward and upward, something that we call, that you might want to put in your notes, WIG history, W-H-I-G, WIG history. Um, this view of history is that things are always progressive, that things are always getting better, that things are always onward and upward. But you'll find when you study computers that through acquisitions, uh, by buying companies to bury the technology, um, by poor decision making on like, you know, an executive's part for a number of different reasons. Uh, sometimes the best isn't always what wins out. Uh, some, there are obviously many myriad forces at play. Uh, and I think it's important to look into that history so that we can learn from the things that may have gotten left behind that were forgotten. Another thing that I work with my colleague, um, Patrick Corbett, who you see standing here, uh, is serious change through play. Uh, and this is something that we've developed using Lego to teach students different communication concepts uh, while being able to actively build with your hands using Lego. Um, I can't, I don't want to move my camera around right now, but I will like show you that my desk is literally surrounded uh, by different Lego artifacts uh, that I enjoy building. 
And I think there's a, the value in the haptic. The haptic means like you know, the tactile touch, the manipulation of things with our hands and seeing things in 3D through our eyes um, is uh, another layer of experience and an intelligence that we can draw on in the, the way that we think about things. I mean, everything isn't just writing things out by hand, which though I will say is a haptic experience itself. Um, but by layering on more things like with Lego, uh, you're able to do so much more than that and also explore the ideas that go into your creations. Hopefully campus will reopen one day. We'll all be protected from the virus and then we can begin playing with Legos again in the classroom. And when that happens, stop by my office hours in NAM 520 and we'll pull out the Legos and we'll talk about like how we can use them to be better communicators. Um, one of the biggest things that I do at City Tech is the City Tech Science Fiction Collection. Here you see one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time, um, uh, African-American gay science fiction writer Samuel R. Delaney, uh, who visited City Tech uh, in 2017, uh, gave a keynote talk at our annual symposium on science fiction. Uh, he's standing in our library where we have one of the largest science fiction collections on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, this was given to us uh, right after I started working at City Tech, and I've played a big role in getting this thing shelved, cataloged, and available for students and researchers to use. Again, because of the campus closings, unfortunately, we can't you know, make easy use of it, uh, but there are a lot of things there that we can access online uh, and so if you have any interest in science fiction, let me know that in your introductory emails uh, that you send later. Uh, and then you, we, can, we can talk about that later, both in office hours or over email. Uh, science fiction is another part of like my professional work. Here I am with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson um, in his office over at the American Museum of Natural History, where he runs the planetarium. Uh, I was on his radio show on May 30th, uh, 2019, uh, to talk about science fiction's relationship to society and how the things that we do in science, how it gets communicated through science fiction, and also how science fiction influences both our society as well as the science that we do. Uh, it was a really great you know, opportunity to be able to talk with you know, someone who's one of my heroes uh, on his radio program about something that's you know, obviously really dear to my heart. Uh, personally, here is me with my wife, Yufong. Uh, this is Lake Geneva behind us in Switzerland. Uh, we got to go there uh, a number of years ago to visit some friends and also go to a conference uh, in Poland. Uh, and we stopped over there on our way to Poland and then stopped again on our way back. Uh, beautiful place, a lot of rich history there. Uh, highly recommend it if you guys get a chance to, to visit there. If Again, we get over or get control of this virus so that... Uh, we are able to travel again. Uh, my wife and I, we love cats. Uh, this in lower right hand corner, hopefully my video isn't obscuring it, but this is uh, Meow Meow uh, in this large Buddha. You're sitting in the palm of this large Buddhist statue in Japan. Uh, she recently passed away. Uh, she had been with us for a long time. Uh, and uh, she moved with us to New York, but uh, unfortunately she got cancer and passed on. But we do have our uh, youngest cat, Mose. Uh, here he is uh, in his cat tree, who we rescued from Atlanta uh, when we lived there before we moved to New York City. So Mose is still with us uh, and uh, this, you know, gives us a lot of joy, especially with being stuck at home all the time because of the virus. Uh, he's a real trooper, helps us out. Uh, some of my personal interests, I mentioned Star Wars, uh, I may not have mentioned Star Wars, I just mentioned science fiction, but Star Wars is where it all began. Uh, this is me uh, back in 1983 with my Darth Vader birthday cake, and I'm wearing my Jabba the Hutt t-shirt. Uh, so that's, I've been a lifelong fan. I, I enjoy all the stuff that Disney's been doing since they took over. Uh, John Favreau and the Mandalorian, amazing stuff going on with Star, Star Wars right now. Uh, Again, I like Lego, and I particularly like building uh, my own model designs. Like here is a uh, skate park that I 
uh, built that I used to keep in the office, uh, but I brought back home after the shutdown. Uh, but you see I got uh, a large and a small half pipe, uh, some rails set up, and people having a good time riding their skateboards. Which connects to my other interest, which is skateboarding culture. Uh, I used to skateboard a long time ago, and I've gotten back uh, into it with constructing boards. Um, actually, this board that you see in the pictures here uh, was a, re, uh, a reissue of a Mike McGill board from the late 80s. And recently, I sold it, and then I acquired this guy, which is a newer model of that reissue, uh, which is the first skateboard that I skateboarded on. Uh, 1988, 1989. Um, pick that up on eBay. I'll be building it out soon uh, with you know trucks, wheels, rails, everything. Um, but my professional interest in this is is studying skateboard culture. Uh, there's a rich history to it. Um, that you know there's obviously a lot of good stuff. There's some your know, negative stuff, but it's like parsing all that out. I think is important, and for raising some awareness about. You know, what we can learn from that past and also th think about how uh, to shape you know, the future of you know, these, these really significant aspects of our culture. All right, so again, just to remind you before we go into the very last part of class today, which are some refresher things and about the uh, first writing assignment, um, my contact information is jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. Always email me, easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Every week, I'll have virtual office hours beginning this week, Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, I'll po post a link to that probably on Google Hangouts uh, on our Open Lab site. Uh, so that link will be live during those two hours. And if that time doesn't work for you, send me an email letting me know when you're available for like the next week, what availability you have. And we'll try to find a time that works for both of us. And then I'll give a plug again for my website, dynamicsubspace.net, where I post a lot of information about a lot of different things that you might find interesting or useful, um, particularly like with computer stuff, which you know, a lot of you guys are in, in different computer-related and computing and networking-related majors. So there may be some things that are interesting there to you. All right, so this brings us to... The last part of this very first and I know like very information rich uh, beginning lectures of the class and it's this writing refresher so these are things that you've probably encountered before uh, but I want to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page and thinking about them and how they might make some of these things useful uh, in our class this semester and maybe your other classes as well so for this decision making um, these decision-making points. First off, I want to say about self-reflection. To be better at anything, including being a better communicator, there is one important exercise that you can begin practicing if you don't already do so, and that's called self-reflection. Self-reflection is the kind of questioning and analysis that you do after you've made a decision. You run through simulations of other options to make that you chose that you choose to do better you think about how given the chance you would make better choices give your work more attention put in more time etc the idea here is that you know, after you've done something take a moment to take stock think about like you know, if you had a little bit more time what other things might you have done and then the next time you get an opportunity to do that put that plan into action that kind of self-reflection is also beneficial for thinking about where you are in your career. What have you accomplished? What do you still hope to do? And then how can you make those things happen? So this is self-reflection. Now, this next point, types of communication decisions. These are things that you should be thinking about in all the different types of work that you do in my classes and your other classes. Even if you just are sending an email to another professor, think about these things. First, with tactical decisions, these are things that are specific and local. They are the micro scale. They're the small things like, you know, how should I construct this sentence? They are things about like, what word should I choose that sounds best? 
how should I address a particular uh, professor? Do I use doctor? Do I use professor? Does this person prefer to use their first name? Whatever those things might be. Then strategic decisions, these are the broad and big picture oriented decisions. They are on a macro scale, big picture stuff. So if we think about these two things, the strategic decisions, if we want to use like the military analogy, they're the things that the general decides about like where to place troops on the battlefield. What is the goal of the overall mission? Whereas the tactical decisions, those are the things that the individual soldiers have to do on the ground, how to make their movement from one place to the next. Who is the enemy and who is like, you know, civilian? These are tactical decisions, small scale things. And when we're writing, we have to make decisions both on, on both of these levels as well. So like strategic decisions would play more a role in the way I might outline or lay out um, a research report. But then the tactical decisions would be like, the individual things that I need to do to make each paragraph work or how to make each sentence stronger or how to cite a particular quote from an article I want to cite. So think about both the big picture as well as the um, smaller scale things that are going on in the work that you do. Then we got these three major concepts that I want you guys to know. Make sure you put this in your notes. Who knows? Some of these words uh, might show up when you're on Jeopardy one day and win you some big bucks and you can come back and you know, buy me a steak dinner at Henry's End. So the first major concept, communication is rhetorical. You've heard of the, the word rhetoric. You know, this is uh, the ancient art of persuasion. How do we persuade people uh, to believe a certain thing, to act a certain way, to follow our directions? And in this way, we mean that communication is persuasive for a particular audience. Okay. Now, the way rhetoric works is that there are these appeals that we can make. And I've listed out five of them here. Ethos, Logos, Pathos, Kairos, and Telos. Okay? So the first three you've probably heard of before. Ethos is an appeal to the speaker's authority or credibility. That's why, like, when you watch, like, any uh, commercial involving, like, you know, medicine, you m will likely see someone wearing a lab coat. Right. The lab coat is meant to indicate this person is like a medical doctor or they might be wearing scrubs. Right. Again, it's something to indicate that they have authority or credibility. Logos. This is an appeal to the logic of the argument. This is where we try to make our arguments logical, that one point follows to the next, that each part of the argument is supported and has evidence. This is Logos. There's pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S, an appeal to the emotions of the audience. So with pathos, isn't necessarily that you're conveying, say, sadness, but that you're trying to make your audience feel sad or feel happy or feel angry. So you have to think of, like, what can you say or do or show that will evoke that emotion in your audience? And there's Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, which is seizing the moment. That is using the right time to make your argument. Excuse me. So, for example, and this is it's a very tragic example, but I think it kind of drives home this point. Is like, obviously in the United States, there are many more mass shootings here than there are anywhere else in the world. But after a mass shooting is when lawmakers begin talking about how we can or should implement new gun control laws. But when there isn't a mass shooting that's all over the news, then nobody's really talking about you know, that we should be imp implementing laws to restrict guns and reduce gun violence. So it always comes down to seizing the right moment, the right time, Kairos. 
And then finally, Telos, T-E-L-O-S. And this is a tricky one. This one is the purpose of the speaker and the purpose of the audience. The thing is that when you're the speaker, you have a certain purpose behind what you're trying to persuade your audience of. But your audience, likewise, can have different purposes to listening to what it is you have to say. They may have you know, different you know, uh, motivations. They may have different ideas. And so telos concerns both the purpose of the speaker as well as the audience. And they may not be the same thing. And it's good to kind of know those things before you go into trying to make a rhetorical appeal to an audience. Because if, if you can't mesh with their purposes, your argument what you're trying to persuade them of might fall flat. This next major concept, communication is multimodal. And I give you this acronym here, WOVEN. This is something that I picked up whenever I was teaching at Georgia Tech that I want you guys to know. WOVEN stands for written, oral, visual, electronic, and nonverbal. So written is communication that is obviously written down. Okay, it's just words on the page or in the screen. Oral communication are words that are spoken. Okay, just, just the words like you're flat out spoken. Not inflected, not, no emphasis, anything. We're going to get to that in a second. Visual is communication that is expressed in a visual medium. So it could be on a screen could be on a printed page, could be in a book, could be a poster, etc. Electronic. This is like the, the major mass communication of today, which is the communication is expressed in an electronic medium. Your phones, a computer, a website, etc. But now here's the tricky one that you, I want you guys to think about, and that's nonverbal. And this is communication that is expressed nonverbally. This includes body language demeanor, cadence of your speech, like you know, how you're pacing it, inflection, haptics and proprioception. That's like, you know, what you feel and touch and how you manipulate things in three-dimensional space, as well as behavior. And so, you know, nonverbal communication, you know, layers very deeply with oral communication. Because you imagine whenever you're speaking, uh, in giving oral communication, you're also using body language, you're using like your voice to like speak loudly or softly, etc. And so all those are nonverbal aspects of, of your oral communication. Now, as you can probably imagine, many of these modes overlap with one another in different ways. For example, giving a presentation might involve you using written notes, speaking orally to an audience, projecting graphics from a computer, and gesturing to the audience while speaking enthusiastically. Okay, so they layer together. And then finally here, communication is audience specific. Meaning that when you're communicating, you're not like communicating to a, a void, to a vacuum. You always have an audience in mind. And your communications might have multiple audiences. And they might even have audiences that you didn't intend. I mean, you can imagine like how there are lots of like um, uh, leaks in the news, uh, both from politicians and celebrities and in which, you know, uh, a communication meant for one party gets leaked to a much different party. And of course, that you know, causes like you know, lots of problems. And so even for yourself in the workplace, you need to think about how your audience specific communications could have unintended audiences. And you need to protect yourself about that. Uh, but whenever you're just developing a communication, whether it be an email, a report, a memo, a poster, whatever it is, you need to have a strong idea of who your intended audience is and how you can connect to that audience using rhetorical techniques by using multimodal woven synergy. Okay. Now, these are strategies for success that I just want to read out to you guys to have you thinking about. And many of these things you may already be doing that you may know about, particularly folks that are, that are about to graduate. But just, just to be on the safe side, I want to mention them. 
And they dovetail with some of the things that I mentioned earlier in today's lecture. And I know some of the things may be cut off because of my picture in the corner, uh, which is why I wanted to read them. So student success strategies. Be prepared to take notes always. Doesn't matter when or where you are. I like whenever I go out, I always keep like a little notepad in my pocket and a pen so I can pull it out if I need to remember something, jot down a date, a phone number, whatever it might be. Uh, I mentioned the Cornell method is really good for you guys while you're making notes on my videos or lectures you go to in your other classes to help with your studying. Return to your notes and rewrite them in a meaningful way to you. The thing is, a lot of people I know make notes and just like go back to them when they need to study. But I found, and this is one of the hard lessons I learned as an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, is that when I would go back to my notes I might have made earlier in the day and then rewrite them so that they look cleaner, so that I you know, are able to look up things in my book that I might have missed or term I might have misspelled, when I made that second set of notes based on the first ones, I just automatically remembered stuff much easier, much better for whenever I had to take an exam. So it's like I didn't have to study as hard later by doing that simple rewriting of my notes. Highly recommended. I recommend keeping a day planner and cross off tasks as you complete them. I mean, there's a, there's a value, I think, in knowing that you're accomplishing things, even if they're small things. And with a day planner, it helps you do that because you have lines where you write down all the things you got to do during the day and you cross them out and you can see all the things that you've accomplished. You can also use your know, apps for that, your know, calendar app uh, for, um, for you know, with that's included with like you know, your Gmail account. If you have that uh, can also help you with that. There's apps that specialize in task management and uh, keeping track of tasks. You can use those as well. I'm a little old school. Another important thing is to dedicate time to your classes. And one thing that you know, I came to understand very late in my career at Georgia Tech was this understanding that you should spend twice as much time outside of class for every credit hour that you're earning. So that means for a three-hour class where you're spending three hours sitting in class, you should be spending six hours outside of class doing the readings, doing the work, doing the research to make it happen, doing the studying. And that's like at a minimum. I, was, I didn't understand that. And I know very early on that hurt me a lot because I just wasn't investing the time I needed to do to be successful. So again, this is you know, hard one advice that I'm offering to you guys to make sure that you stay on point, not just in my class, but in your other classes as well. And then we're down to the penultimate. Penultimate means the next to the last thing. So the penultimate thing I have here is curate the work that you do in a portfolio for use in job applications. I mentioned that earlier. The reason why I like using Open Lab for you guys is that you any of the work that you do, you can copy it directly. There's like a little link that you should see whenever you create a post on our Open Lab site. You click that link and that automatically plugs your work over into your ePortfolio. Makes it easier than sin, um, which is your advantageous because if things are easy, it helps you build a more robust and um, more demonstrating ePortfolio of the work that you can do. And then finally, write and regularly update your professional documents and online identity. So I'm talking about your resumes, application letters, your LinkedIn.com profile, if you have a personal website, your social media accounts that you might be using uh, for professional purposes. Keep all that stuff up to date and return to them as a part of your own self-reflective practices because that helps keep you fresh. It keeps the work you're trying to demonstrate fresh so that you're always ready for that next uh, opportunity that may come up and with the way that the workplace has changed fundamentally in the past decade where you really honestly can't expect to put in your 40 years at some place and then retire you need to be dynamic you need to be ready to adjust for anything that may come up and be ready for a big opportunity that comes along that you can take advantage of and by doing that self-reflective work by keeping your your materials up to date 
you're going to be you know, first in line for those opportunities. And maybe we can talk more about that later uh, in the semester, uh, about job stuff. Let me know if you guys are interested in that when you send me your emails. Which brings us to our first writing assignment in the class. And this is, you know, like I said, these, this is the easiest part of your grade uh, to attain by keeping up with these assignments. For this first assignment, I don't want you posting this on our Open Lab site because I want to give everybody a chance to actually join the site and get familiar with it. We'll have our first writing assignment that you actually use our Open Lab site for uh, for, for week two. Okay, so this first one is just an email assignment. I want you to send me an email uh, to my email address right there, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu from your City Tech email account. Not from your Gmail account, not your Hotmail account, not your hot yahoo.com account, but from your official City Tech email account. If by chance you've forgotten your password to that account, uh, you need to go down to this link I give you at the bottom of the page, forgot citytech.cuny.edu that that site has a link that you click on and you can reset your password so you can get into your student email account very important because that's where I want to be sending all the emails for everyone in the class is through that official uh, city tech email account and you also have to have access to that to set up your open lab account if you don't already have an open lab account so it's vitally important uh, essential for success in our class that you have access to that email. So for the assignment, you start an email to me, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, make sure you give it a subject line, ENG 2575, student introduction is what I'd like to see. Um, make sure you familiarize yourself with like, you know, what uh, the email looks like um, and how to use it. Uh, if anybody has questions about that, shoot me an email, let me know. Uh, I guess if you are having trouble with your email, you might need to come to my office hours and let me know. But in either of, either case, I will help you with that. Uh, but familiarize yourself with the difference between the subject line, where you simply just give the subject of what you're going to be talking about in your email. In this case, ENG 2575 student introduction. Then in the the, the written part of your um, email, the main body of your email, I'd like to see a salutation, simply like, you know, hello, Professor Ellis, dear Professor Ellis, greetings, Professor Ellis, hi, Professor Ellis. Very simple and straightforward uh, and just shows a, a little bit of politeness on your part. Can go a long ways with some folks. Skip a line and then begin the body of your email. In the email, you should lead it with like the subject line. I didn't mention this here, but like any email you send, you should let a person know like why you're sending it. In this case, you could say, um, I would like to introduce myself to you or I would like to tell you a little bit more about myself because I'm taking your English 2575 class. Think of some reason. Um, and then that's your introduction to the, the body of your email in which you can tell me about yourself. Like what's your major, what are your career goals? Do you have some cool hobbies? Um, does something interesting happened to you before you want to mention, and then probably most importantly, what do you want to get out of the class? So anything like if you want to be a better writer, a better speaker, let me know, because then those are things I can kind of keep uh, on the top of my head as I'm designing things as we move through the class to make sure I give you more uh, opportunities for that as we move forward on top of like what we're already trying to accomplish. Uh, then, and the same is true like if uh, you're interested in like your job application materials, you can let me know about that and maybe we can fit that in somehow. Then after the body, give a closing. Uh, you can say best wishes, comma, and then your name or best, comma, your name, cheers, comma, your name, sincerely, comma, your name. You can look on Google. There's a million different closings you can use. Uh, but sign it with your name uh, the way that you would like me to refer to you. So like if you go by your first name, your middle name, a nickname, uh, or you, whatever name it might be, let me know what that is. And then that's, that's the name that I can use when we do correspondence. 
So that's everything. Um, make sure for next week uh, that you do this writing assignment. Uh, just by you know, sending the email, you get full credit. Easy as that. Um, take a look at the readings that I put on the schedule. Make sure you join our Open Lab uh, site or join our class on Open Lab. Uh, then navigate to the site so you can look at the syllabus and see how things are organized. You're going to see this uh, lecture there. And then remember, I'll have my office hours on Wednesday from 3 until 5. I'll post a link on our Open Lab site. So you just click the link and that will take you over to where I am virtually and we can chat about whatever we need to about the class. And I'll do that every Wednesday. Um, and if things come up and I have to reschedule or offer different times, I'll let you guys know in advance about that. Uh, and then if you need a different time, send me a, di you know, a separate email letting me know when you're available and we'll set that up. Okay? So I hope this has been helpful. I know I gave you guys a lot to deal with today, but you know I want I want everybody to be on a good foundation, you know, going forward. I want to make this class work for you all, uh, and I'm gonna you know, give it as much as you give. So uh, any way I can help you, questions I can answer, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay? So I'm looking forward to this semester. I know it's gonna be a weird semester, but um, you know, by God, I know we can make it through this thing together. All right, so good luck with our class and your other classes and everything else you got going on. And I'll see you later.